Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. From the Gospel lesson. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Won't you please be seated, my sisters and brothers in Christ. It is said that you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your parents. And that's true with the town in which you are born also. You can't choose it. I wonder if you could, how many of you would have ever chosen Blue Earth, Minnesota? I had no choice. Or how about Hell, Michigan? Yeah, there really is a town by that name. How about Kooten, <laughs> Cut and Shoot, Texas? Cut and Shoot, Texas. 30 miles south of Houston, population 1,290. Yeah, you can't choose where you're born. Well, it's a mystery why in the world God chose little Bethlehem as the birthplace of Jesus, except perhaps that it was part of his perfect plan in eternity. And Micah, the Old Testament prophet, had foretold it hundreds of years before in the wonderful Old Testament lesson we had tonight. But you, Bethlehem, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of the forth the one to rule Israel, whose goings forth are from the old, from everlasting to everlasting. Those 38 words in that simple verse from Micah chapter 5 prophesy that this little insignificant town, least among the clans of Judah, will become great. Yes, his words may be brief, but they contain a wealth of spiritual truth. The story of Bethlehem is a special story that needs to be told and retold again, especially in these days in which we live, and that's why we're going to do it one more time tonight. We're going to tell the story of Bethlehem. Tonight I want us to see how mightily this prophecy was fulfilled and what it says about us as we end our Advent preparation season, as we bring it to a close. It was in 1865, the Civil War had just finished, and a pastor from Boston went to the Holy Lands. He went over there to help out with a Christmas Eve service, quite frankly, over in the Holy Land, and he rode on a horse from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to the spot where Jesus was said to have been born. He was inspired. And after he came back home two years later in 1867, Philip Brooks put his pen to paper, uh, recalled the journey that he had made, and wrote the song that we just sang, O Little Town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in Bethlehem tonight. If you go to Bethlehem today, in addition to the Church of the Holy Nativity, you will also be taken to Rachel's tomb. I mention that so I can go back many, many years B.C. into the story of the Old Testament. Rachel, you remember, was the wife of Jacob. And she was buried in Bethlehem after she had died giving birth to Benjamin, the last of the twelve sons of of Jacob, Benjamin, you know, one of those 12 sons who star in the Broadway play Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. Uh, yeah, Rachel died there, giving birth to little Benjamin. Now jump forward a few years, a few hundred years, to when Joshua was about to enter the Promised Land, and we learn that Rahab, the prostitute, who survived the destruction of Joshua, you know, Joshua at the Battle of Jericho, uh, who survived the battle of Jericho, married a man named Solomon, and they settled in the vicinity of Bethlehem. He was from the line that would lead eventually to David. That's important. But before we get to David, let's learn what the word Bethlehem means. It means house of bread. Now that's a little ironic, 
because we move on further into Old Testament history and we realize that Bethlehem didn't exactly live up to its name, House of Bread, when a famine struck Bethlehem and the area around and Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons had to move to Moab in order to have something to eat. And it was in Moab that Elimelech and both of the sons died. And then we learn from the book of Ruth that Ruth, the Moabite, came back then with Naomi, her mother-in-law. You know that text that's used in a lot of weddings, uh, as though you think it's from husband to wife, where you lodge, I will lodge, your people will buy, be my people, your God will be my God. Uh, that wasn't between a husband and wife, that was between a woman who had lost her family with her mother-in-law, Ruth. And so Ruth came back to Bethlehem then with Naomi, and it's there that she met Boaz, native of Bethlehem. Ruth and Boaz's grandson would be Jesse, who happened to father a son named David, who became Israel's second king, and the one, of course, that took Israel to its greatest power. Samuel, the prophet, came to Bethlehem in order to anoint David as king there. Yeah, so you see, this whole history, this whole story is not bad for such a small little dump of a town called Bethlehem. But then as David's line became a stump, in other words, after David's greatness, uh, David's uh, descendants didn't follow in the same path with the Lord, and, and by the time Micah is on hand, David's line is not a great flowering tree, it's a stump. You, you remember that stump from the root of David, right? Bethlehem became kind of nothing in Israel's history by the time of Micah. And that's why Micah the prophet, when he gave his messianic promise to Israel, called Bethlehem, you who are nothing, you who are little in the clans of Judah, little town of Bethlehem. All right? You probably remember all that, but it was a good little history lesson tonight, right? To kind of understand the role that this little town played. Scholars have counted over 300 predictions about the coming of the Messiah that are contained in the Old Testament. And they say that the chance of all of them coming true is represented by a fraction whose numerator above the line is one and whose denominator below the line is 84 followed by 100 zeros. In other words, there's a slim to none chance that all the prophecies, 300 of them, would all come true. But if God says the Messiah is going, in, born, going to be born in Bethlehem, you can count on the fact that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. So how did that all happen then? From Micah's time until the time of the Holy Nativity. What did God do to make this kind of unbelievable prophecy come true? To, what did God do to make this town who's the least of the clans of Judah famous as it is today? Well, he made it the focal point of the crossroads of all, all of human history. And to do it, he even had to move emperors and kings. He used human history to fulfill his perfect plan. He's done it since then, of course, also. But this is the most classic way in which he did it. As a matter of fact, one in human history by the name of Caesar Augustus ruled the Roman Empire from 44 BC until his death in 16 AD. He followed his uncle, Julius Caesar, and became master of the world when he defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra, queen of Egypt. You've heard of those guys, right? From human history. And Quirinius happened to be governor at that time, right? We got him in the Bible. Why would Quirinius ever be in the Bible? Why would Pontius Pilate ever be in the Christian creeds? Only one reason. To show us how God uses human history to accomplish his perfect plan. Be awed by that, my friends, tonight. Just, be, just have some wonderful wonder and joy at the way God moves through human history. And without a question, the greatest thing Caesar Augustus ever did was probably the least known of all. Early in his reign, he called for a census to be taken for taxation purposes. 
a secular census to be taken from our gospel reading, the familiar Christmas story, remember? Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Why? To be registered with Mary, his espoused, who was with child. Yeah, Caesar Augustus. It is sadly joked that if Mary and Joseph had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem today, the baby would be born at an Israeli checkpoint. Since there is now a mass of bureaucracy between Israel and the Palestinian territory. As a matter of fact, there's a huge wall today that separates Jerusalem from Bethlehem because Bethlehem is a Palestinian town now. But I digress. My point is that God used Caesar the world's most powerful figure, to assure that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. That holy night, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace, was born there. God took upon himself human flesh. The Savior of the world, as announced to the shepherds, was born there. Or as one American astronaut put it years ago, if we think it was great that we went to the moon, How much greater is it that God came to his earth? And that night, God dispatched angels from heaven to a little town to announce the good news to humble shepherds abiding in the fields of Bethlehem as even young David had done a thousand years earlier. And up in the sky were not only angels, but was a star hovering not over great Jerusalem, not over the holy temple, not above King Herod, but over a little town called Bethlehem. And wise men from the east came with their gifts, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright. Guide us to the perfect light in Bethlehem. That, by the way, the wonder of it all, will be the theme of our preaching here at St. Paul during the weeks of Epiphany. Of course, now since Christ was born, Bethlehem has become one of the most well-known cities on the face of the globe. It's become a theme for poets, a subject for artists, uh, the very topic of beautiful choral anthems. Uh, Susan and I have been privileged to be there twice. Some of you have been there. The great church of the Holy Nativity was built over the site where the fabled stable was. The inner cave over which the first church was built was later rebuilt then by Constantine's mother, the Empress uh, Helena, in 339 AD. It was then destroyed mostly in the 5th century. It was rebuilt then with the present basilica by the Emperor Justinian in the mid-6th century. And it stands today as the oldest Christian church that is in daily use. Why? Because of Jesus. Bethlehem did become the house of bread for a starving, dying world. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The whole world praises God for that obscure town because it has brought salvation to all who believe. And that leads us then to our Advent lesson for tonight. If a humble village through its association with Jesus Christ and its connection to the perfect plan of God can become a place that has changed human history, then think of what God can do through you. Through you. Micah said, Bethlehem, though you are little, yet out of you will come great things. That ought to give us encouragement on this Advent night. There was nothing exceptional about Bethlehem. And yet God used it greatly. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than I do will you do, because I go to the Father. We are the vessels of clay entrusted with the jewels of God. Broken pots pouring out into the world God's good news. The hardest part, I suppose, of being used by God sometimes is simply believing that God can use you and me. We get held back by inferiority complexes. You know, I've always said, you know, if we 
say Sunday after Sunday that we are poor, miserable sinners, pretty soon we start to believe it. And of course we are. But we are redeemed. We think sometimes in the great plan of God that we are nothing. Our Lutheran humility causes us to shrink back into some kind of spiritual cave and think that we have very little to offer to the great kingdom of God. Folks, you can search high and low in the scriptures for any such cop-out. That is a cop-out. God desires us to do great things in his name. Right in your own family, when you seek to pass the faith from one generation to the other, as other faithful generations have passed it on to you, and to give to your young ones, whether they be children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or whatever, a picture of what a Christ-like life looks like. You start with your own family, and then at work or in school, when colleagues can see in you the love of Christ, in your gentle kindness and compassion, in your devotion, and in your neighborhood, when right over the fence those neighbors will find a caring representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you are willing to take a stand in our country for God's will as our country drifts, f- drifts further and further away from his will. You stand up against that trend. You stand up on the solid rock of Christ and of his word. And in the way in which you discern that will, by the way, by being connected to God's word through which his perfect plan is made clear and stands forever and ever. And by connecting to your fellow believers in regular worship, in Christian fellowship, building each other up and making sure that we hold one another accountable within the body of Christ. And by pooling together our monetary and talent, ability, resources in generous ways so that we can do together what none of us could ever do alone. Tonight, before we leave Advent, before we bow down at the manger of the Christ child, I want us all to take an inventory. Just take an inventory of the wonderful things that God has done and is doing right now through you. And then imagine, just imagine how much more he can do in the new year that is coming. We have a call out for people just like you to help out in all the phases of our ministry here at St. Paul and beyond. In our educational programs, maybe to begin a a small group ministry in your home, to keep up this wonderful facility by assisting our trustees, to help in many ways with our worship services, singing in choirs, for contemporary worship week after week, to help with things like coffee hour and hunger ministry, to help with technology needs, you know, projection and streaming ministries, shepherd guides for our youth programs, Volunteers for our school, heading up more opportunities for Christian fellowship, reaching out to assist with our partners, things like building Hope in the City and the Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries and the Lutheran Home at Concord Reserve and our wonderful high school association. Just imagine how much more through us in this new year that is coming, God can use us for. After all, look at what he did for Bethlehem. If you are the part of the perfect plan of God, there is nothing little about you or about the little town of Bethlehem. So let us then, as Advent comes to a close, commit to one another just one simple thing tonight. That this weekend we're going to celebrate the coming of the Christ child like never before. God help us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please rise. And may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds with Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. You know what? Before we sit down and take the offering, you're kind of clumped together enough, except for the wonderful Nelson family up here all by themselves, (laughs) that you can turn around and just wish one another a blessed Advent and Christmas. Introduce yourself if you don't know them, okay? Do that right now where you stand.